Sometimes even good people can make a mistake. And when it happens, it's one of the most intense and emotional experiences of your life. It could be a DUI, or maybe you were in the wrong place with the wrong people at the wrong time. Or perhaps you just did something stupid at the spur of the moment without even thinking, and now you're in trouble with the law. Well, you need experienced legal help right away so you don't become a victim of the criminal justice system. Even good people can make a mistake, and if you, a friend or a loved one, has been accused of a crime, don't make another mistake by hiring the wrong attorney for the kind of help you need. You need to visit ToddJohnsLaw.com. That's ToddJohnsLaw.com, and then call Attorney Todd Johns today. Attorney Todd Johns has decades of experience helping good people like you who have made mistakes or bad decisions and will stand by you every step of the way. ToddJohnsLaw.com. That's Enough Out of You is also sponsored by Case Quattro Winery, featuring over 20 flavors of wine from dry red, dry white, and fruit for your sampling pleasure. Case Quattro Winery offers entertainment, parties, and private events. Now serving a full menu with a little something for everyone, including appetizers, salads, dinners, pizza, and desserts. Case Quattro has some of the best live entertainment in the area with comedy and karaoke nights and live bands. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram for all of our upcoming events. And if you mention the code OUTA, that's O-U-T-T-A, you get 15% off of your order. Located on Main Street in Peckville, Pennsylvania, call 570-382-3855 for more information. And we thank Case Quattro Winery for their support. Welcome to That's Enough Out of You. I am your host, Bill Rader. And joining me on That's Enough Out of You today is my co-host, Sean Kane. Sean, what's going on? Billy Raids, how you doing, buddy? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. We have a great episode today. Uh, returning to the program is uh, one of, if not the premier uh, JFK historian, researcher, uh, in in the world, and that is uh, Jim Diaginio. Jim, welcome back to the program. Hello, Jim. Nice to, nice to be here for both of you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, great to have you, Sean. We got uh, a, a very interesting topic. Jim's uh, most recent article on his website, Kennedys and King. Uh, so let's let's get right into that. Well, you know, we've been having uh, right now. We have an episode up where we're debunking that that what Jim calls a novel in in that crappy book, Double Cross. And then we've had Don McGovern on, and he talked about Mark Shaw in in the book Bombshell. And um, you know, we're going to have Don back um, in the summer. He's working on an episode for us where we're going to take apart David Heyman. Um, so this fits right in a lot of the things we're doing now. And we're talking about Jim's fantastic article up on Kennedy's and King called Brad Pitt, Joyce Carol Oates, and the Road to Blonde, um, which is this movie that came out of Marilyn Monroe. And it's 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 really a disgraceful movie. But Jim, I open the floor to you where you want to start. Do you want to start where the article started with with a kind of a background of how we got to this awful level on on all this Marilyn Monroe stuff? But I open the floor to you, sir. Well, in well, in the article. See, there's two versions of Blonde. There's a CBS version, which I think was 2001. And then there was a Netflix version, which I think was 2022. Unfortunately, I had to watch both of them. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and after I saw this, especially this, the Brad Pitt one for Netflix, uh, I was really kind of uh, appalled. So I said, you know, I'm going to read this novel. But see, the thing is about Joyce Carol Oates' novel, it's not really a novel. It's what they call a Romana clef, which it's supposed to be based on true events that are then uh, slightly fictionalized. That's what you do with the Romana clef. 
Okay. Well, Joyce Carol Oates' novel Blonde is really kind of a compendium of some, I would call them sensationalized books. And so in all the reading I did on this, um, I, I did read some other books. Well, first of all, I had to read every book that Joyce Carol Oates based her novel on. That was about five different books, including Anthony Summers' book, Goddess. Oh. Okay. All right. And then I had to read what are more or less the more accurate uh, chronicles of Marilyn Monroe's life and death. Okay. And know that is Don McGovern, Gary Vitaco Robles, who wrote a huge, colossal book on the circumstances of her death, which is about 1,200 pages long, okay? And it's, uh, it's called Icon, all right? And I read the blog post by a girl named April Vivea, okay, who's very good on this also. Right. And... Uh, I'll tell you this, that Oates incorporated some of this stuff in her Romana class is, is simply really inexplicable, except that she want what most of these people want to do, they want to attract media attention, all right? Uh, and so that this is how we do it, all right? And this started, of course, uh, with Norman Mailer, all right? And his picture book, which he was, if you recall, Norman Mailer was supposed to write an introduction to a picture book by Larry Schiller. Okay. Larry Schiller, be, to explain this guy, you know, would take a different show. But Larry Schiller is a guy, he's like an ambulance chaser, all right? He first, he, be, he was an informant to the FBI on the Kennedy assassination, especially Mark Lane and Jim Garrison. He then poked his nose into the, uh, the infamous uh, Manson case in Los Angeles, all right? Uh, he was there quite early, went to the jail, and did an interview with one of uh, with one of Manson's uh, followers. Okay, all right. Uh, then on the Maryland thing, okay, he does this picture books in which he wants Norman Mailer to write an introduction. Except Mailer's introduction turned out to be ninety thousand words long, and he borrowed a lot of it from uh, Lauren Skiles book, which at that time was the one substantial biography of Monroe, all right? What happened next is that Mailer decided to go back to Frank Capel's pamphlet in order to spice up the book, okay? If you recall, and if you had McGovern on, which I think you did. Yeah, we I, did. All right. Well, that's how all this started. That's how all this rubbish began. Well, Capel was a right wing lunatic. Right. OK. Uh, who was determined not to have Bobby Kennedy follow in his brother's footsteps. Right. OK. And so he unleashed a, ta a tall tale about Bobby Kennedy being part of a communist conspiracy, having an affair with Marilyn Monroe, and then going ahead and having a role in her murder, okay? Okay, and so this pamphlet was circulated through New York State, okay, for this 1964 senatorial campaign in order to hurt Bobby Kennedy, okay? And this is where Mailer went for his little chapter on the alleged 
assassination of Marilyn Monroe, which was one of the final chapters of that book. All right. Mailer himself didn't even believe this. All right. And he more or less admitted this in an, in an interview with Mike Wallace. OK, that that uh, he really didn't think Bobby Kennedy was even which he was not. He was not in Los Angeles that day. All right. OK. And and he said he badly needed the money. He'd been through a very expensive divorce, was paying a lot of alimony. OK. And so this is why I did it. And it worked. It worked because that book sold a million copies. All right. Uh, and as John Gilmore said, it was the beginning of this industry. Let's trash Maryland for a buck. OK. And, and this is one of the things I want to get across in this interview. That all of these books, and I had to read several of them, okay, it's a form of character assassination. Right. And, and, I'll, and I'll get back to why I think that in a, in a few moments when we progress along. Okay. But what this, all this stuff does, you know, that somehow Marilyn Monroe was a mafia mall. <laughs> that Marilyn Monroe was a CIA a covert CIA <laughs> secret agent. Okay, that that she was the prospective wife. She was going to be the first lady, the Bobby Kennedy. Uh, you know, all this stuff. It it really is a is a horrible cesspool. You know, of smears about who she really was. Okay, and to be, I want to be perfectly honest about this when. When I first began on this whole trail uh, back in the 19, I think 1997, over that bunch of crap that Seymour, Seymour Hearst tried to put out in his book, I really didn't think very much of Marilyn Monroe, okay? But now, now that I've done a lot more work on it, okay, especially for this article, you know, I see her as a, quite a sympathetic person. All right. Right. And and really, as a performer, she was a quite skilled comedian. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you take a look on YouTube, look up the skit she did with Jack Benny. OK, on his show. All right. And there's also the very same skit. You can find it with Jane Mansfield. OK. And it's night and day. You right. know, Marilyn Monroe was a very gifted comedian, all right? And and uh, although she was trying to break out of that, you know, she really did do a very good job in those kinds of parts, like Some Like It Hot, you know? Um, but anyway, to get back to our main story, see, once Mailer did that breakthrough with this huge selling picture book, that opened a door to a guy named Robert Schlatzer. And when, when I say open the door, Robert Oof. Schlatzer opened up a Pandora's box. Right. Okay. Um, he was really the guy who knocked down the doors of acceptability in fiction in, in nonfiction writing, you know, and turned it into a, a really tabloid industry. And right. I'm not just talking about the Monroe thing. I mean, I, I think his the life and mysterious death of Marilyn Monroe is is kind of a milestone in how publishing companies would now be willing to go ahead and consciously break down uh, the rules for writing nonfiction and biography. And this book went through, I think, at least three printings in its first year. All right, Slatzer, and the reason I'm saying this is because Slatzer is very much used by Summers, okay? And Summers' book was very much used by Joyce Carol Oates. Right. Okay, so that's why this is important, all right? Slatzer made up so many stories that, you know, you, you can't really elucidate all of them in an essay. The book right. is that bad. But let me explain how it got started. Slatzer was actually thinking of doing a conspiracy book about Monroe's death uh, before Mailer's book came out. 
And he went to a famous journalist named Wolf Fowler, and who's based in Los Angeles at that time. And he pitched this idea to Wolf Fowler. And Fowler said something like, now, now, if you were married to Marilyn Monroe, that would that would have been different. OK, right. so a few months later, he comes back and he says, you know, I forgot to tell you, I was married to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. OK. All right. And so this is part of his book. OK, this this whole mythological fictionalized, you know, uh, complete fantasy that he was married to Marilyn Monroe in Mexico. OK. All right. And uh, Tijuana. And uh, they came back to Los Angeles and they had second thoughts about it. And they went back and they got the marriage certificate, according to Flatzer. You know, they got it. The, the barrister there burned it. OK, now, now this story has been completely decimated. Right. OK, by April Vivea. OK, and Donald Spoto, because it turns out that April Vivea was at a party for Photoplay magazine on the first day they were supposed to be down there. And she was on a shopping spree in Beverly Hills on the second day she was supposed to be there. In fact, there's a picture of the first and she wrote a check for the second. Right. Okay. Right. So this is complete, absolute baloney. All right. That, that he came up with, but it's not the only piece of baloney in his book. Okay. There's also the guy, this fictionalized informant named Jack Quinn. Yeah. Okay. Who was supposed to be knowledgeable about the secret investigation the 732 page report that LAPD turned out. All right. And this included a deposition by Robert Kennedy. Now, this is this is so utter baloney that it's ridiculous. Okay. There was no secret report. There was no Jack Quinn. Okay. <laughs> right, right. All right. And there was no secret deposition <laughs> by Robert Kennedy. Okay. This was all, you know, this was all a bunch of fantasy created, you know, by Slatcher to sell this book. Right. All right. Now, Will Fowler, who was a pretty right wing guy, he dropped out of this project. All right. He dropped because he came to the conclusion that Slatcher was a fraud, which he was. OK. All right. Yeah. And, and so then what happened is they brought in Capel. OK, and Capel was a secret collaborator. OK, but Capel had so many charges, verdicts against him. I think it was three, you know, two for uh, uh, two for accepting bribes during World War Two. He's on the War Production Board and one for libel in 1965 that they tried to keep his cooperation on the project secret. But he did the Robert Kennedy stuff. All right. Uh, and so what happened is that Slatcher's book, the success, the popular success of that book, number one, it influenced a lot of, a lot of other following books, magazines and TV films. OK, Slatcher had two TV films based on his books. He wrote another one, I think, in 1992 called The Maryland Files which in some ways is even worse than, the, than his first book. OK, but he also said in that first book that Bobby Kennedy had promised to marry Marilyn Monroe. Unbelievable. OK, and number two, that Bobby <laughs> Kennedy was running the Bay of Pigs operation. All right. Oh, and I forgot. Bobby Kennedy was part of Murder Incorporated, you know, the whole mafia killing thing I mean, unbelievable okay unbelievable. you know unbelievable. this is but this is the kind of garbage you know that got stuffed in to this Marilyn Monroe field all right now along comes another generation because this is what happened Slatzer did an interview rather a speech at the Los Angeles Press Club attacking the LAPD for not reopening the Marilyn Monroe case, all right? 
John Van de Kamp, the DA at the time, did what they called a threshold investigation. What that means is you're trying to see if there's any real cause to reopen a full investigation. So there were Ronald Carroll, his trusted aide, and two investigative assistants. Okay, um, they went on a, they decided to go ahead and interview many, many people in a four month inquiry. All right. They came away convinced that Thomas Taguchi, the original coroner in the case, was correct. All right. That Monroe had taken her own life, either on purpose or by accident. That is what happened. All right. And they brought in a pathologist from San Francisco, Boyd Stevens, all right, to review Noguchi's autopsy. And he came to the same conclusion. See, here's the key to understanding what the case was about. There were no puncture wounds found on Monroe's body. Right. There certainly weren't any bullet wounds. Okay, so either the drugs were injected or they were ingested. Okay, Boyd Stevens and Noguchi came to the conclusion from the autopsy that they were ingested because they had gone through the digestive system. All right, all right, and they were headed towards your uh, towards your liver. Okay, as Many people have pointed out, Boyd Stevens being one, Don McGovern another, if they were injected, they would have been more in the bloodstream, okay? And they were not, all right? Now, all of these liars that Slatzer and Summers employed, you know, like, like Jim Clemens, you know, right. the, uh, the police officer who April Vey was very frank about, called him a dirty cop, which he was, yeah. okay? You know, he simply said he simply created this story that a uh, her position looked posed because people who die of those kinds of sleeping pills, okay, chloral hydrate and nebutal have convulsions. That's not true. Boyd Stevens said that that's not true. They asked him that question. Secondly, there was no glass in the room. Well, the LAPD took pictures, and there was a glass in the room. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You know, so, you know, people like Clemens, who other people in this field have used and, you know, and Slatzer are simply not credible witnesses. No. So any any book that uses these kind of people are simply not credible. Right. So what, what happened is that after Ronald Carroll did his investigation, all right, uh, Summers came in and started his book. Now, somewhere between him, a uh, slasher doing the speech, okay, at the LA Press Club, and Summers' book, there materialized out of nowhere a woman named Jean Carmen. Jean Carmen, yeah. Okay. Now, only in the Marilyn Monroe field could somebody like Jean Carmen even <laughs> materialize, okay? Because like I wrote in my essay, if you had witnesses like this in the JFK case, they would be knocked the stuffings out of them in about a week, right? okay? Because there's, there's so many people in that field and they're so experienced that they understand, you know, what is BS and what is accurate information. At that time, there was no such thing in the Marilyn Monroe field, okay? And so, Jean Carmen now became a witness for Tony Summers in his book, Goddess. This is utterly ridiculous, all right? Jean, Jean Carmen is up there with Bob Slatzer. Yeah, as and, and a, Jim... Uh, uh, Slatzer's first book, he never mentions Jeannie Carmen at all. Now, right? now, 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 that's what I was going to get to. Okay, okay, okay. That's very, very interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Because, see, according to Slatzer, he was Marilyn's best friend. 
even after their so-called canceled wedding, they still were friends, okay? Now, Jean Carmen came along with the pose that she was Marilyn's best girlfriend. Right. Well, how come then that <laughs> Slatcher never mentioned her name once in his original 1973-1974 book? Right. How, how could that be? Right. All right. You know, but it was. So now Jean Carmen comes along. All right. And now she is the woman who really most of these books use to certify a relationship between Bobby Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe. And number two, she's the one <clears throat> who brings in the mob, the mafia angle. Okay. Jim, and in- can you tell what she said about the Gene Connor murder? Because it's, it's you're, unbelievable. You're, 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 so where do you hear it is? You're, you're, you're predicting my my. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. All right, okay. <laughs> she even went as far as to say that Johnny Rosselli killed Sam Giancana in Chicago over Maryland. And in fact, as he put the gun in his mouth, he said, This is for Maryland. Okay. Oh my God. Now, now you know how ridiculous this is. This is, first of all, Johnny Rosselli wasn't in Chicago at no. that time. Okay. All right. Um, he was in Florida. He was living in Florida. And he's preparing to testify before the church committee. All right. And number two, okay, the, the idea that Johnny Rosselli was somehow so attached to Marilyn Monroe and that somehow Giancana was in on her killing is, I mean, this is science fiction. You yeah. know, this is just, you know, it, it, it's just utterly, utterly ridiculous. Now, Jeannie Carmen, Jeannie Carmen said that on, first of all, there's about three stages to what she added to this rigmarole about the, the so-called murder of Marilyn Monroe. Number one, Marilyn called her up that night, wanted some pills. The idea that Marilyn needed Jean Carmen to give her pills is utterly not is utter nonsense. Okay. Right. All right. She had a lot of pills to begin with. And her psychiatrist, yeah. Greenson, said that she was hoarding pills and she was getting them off the black market and a and a different doctor from the studio, Lee Siegel. Number two that she went to Marilyn's home late that night. Okay. All right. Uh-uh. No way. All right. Okay. And number three, <laughs> I can barely say this without laughing. Fred Otash oh. came to her house that night, threw her on the floor, <laughs> And said Giancana had Marilyn killed and he wanted to kill her too, but he pleaded for her life and that's why she was spared. Giancana sent a four man hit team to Oh my god. <laughs> to Monroe's home and here's the capper. They anally raped Eunice Murray. Okay, Eunice Murray was a housemate for yeah. Marilyn. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, anybody who could possibly believe this stuff, you know, probably believes that the, the moon is full of green cheese, you know, yeah. but, but Summers gave Gene Carmen a sp- prominent spot in his book. All right. And then she was accepted for a long time, you know, by, by very, very many people. Okay. Mm. But this is, this is, oh, should I bring in Gary Ween? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In Summer's book, he uses Gary Ween. Gary Ween was a police officer in both Ventura and LA counties. He begins in his book, Goddess, he kind of begins pretty much his assault on the character of Peter Lawford and JFK with an interview with Gary Ween. 
Gary Ween said words of the effect, and this is what is in the goddess, that somehow Lawford would arrange uh, wild parties with invited call girls at his beach house in Malibu. All right. And JFK was at one of them. All right. And Marilyn was at one of them. Well, I said, well, who the heck is Gary Ween? And why should we believe him? So I sent away for his book. I had to, I had to get it from Atlanta, Georgia, you know, on a book transfer. It cost me like 20 bucks. Okay. Through the interlibrary loan. And I had to read the book at the lumber at the library. So every day for about four days, I drove up to the Studio City Library, put my nose in this book, and I was really kind of at the end of that four days, you know, there there's there's books you read in this field in which you feel like a better person, like James Doug Douglas's book, JFK right. the Unspeakable. Sure. And there's books you read in this field where, you know, you can't wait to get out of the library, go home and have a hamburger. Okay. Well, like double cross. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the way I felt after reading. I think the name of the book is a fish. There's a fish in the courthouse. <sighs> where to, where to begin with this? Okay. First of all, it's not just a Maryland case that he writes about in this book. He also writes about the JFK assassination. See, his book was supposed to be about a money and property scandal in Ventura County. And that is one focus of the book. But I believe that because the stuff about Maryland and JFK is so unbelievable, you know, I kind of think that he threw, this, he threw this other stuff in there in order to enhance the sales of the book, which I don't think it did, all right? And so the book, I don't, I don't know how anybody can come away not thinking this if you read it. The book is very anti-Semitic, all right? And yeah. he, he says that the JFK assassination was arranged by Mickey Cohen, or else right. he was one of the major players in it. Okay, well, be perfectly frank, I've never seen that anywhere. No. That Mickey uh -huh. Cohen was in on the JFK assassination. No. You know. But Mickey Cohen was Jewish. Right. And, and he actually calls it a Jewish plot to kill Kennedy. And this is where he gets into. And, and I, I don't know if he told Summers this stuff or and Summers didn't put it in or if somehow uh, he didn't tell Summers this stuff. I, 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 I can't really tell. All right. This is what he says. And this is what it was so startling to me when I read this. He says that it was something called the Mishpaka, which he terms uh, the Jewish conspiracy in the United States that used Marilyn to get information about John F. Kennedy, all right, uh, about his policies that they were worried about and in the book he says that it wasn't really peter lawford but it was joey bishop and joey joey bishop of course was jewish right all right who put together these parties and if you can believe it in the book summers calls joey bishop okay and he then he talks to ween and says you were right okay now now listen I had to get up and walk around after reading this. Okay. Right. <laughs> first of all, first of all, P from what I could find, Peter Lawford didn't have a house in Malibu. Peter Lawford had a house in Santa Monica and in Palm Springs. Nobody who lives in Southern California can confuse Santa Monica or Palm Springs with Malibu. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, he says, that she was here for the, Marilyn was here for the Democratic Convention at one of these parties. Marilyn was in New York City at the time of the Democratic Convention. Okay, but she was not in LA 
at that time. And I believe <clears throat> those are rather easily discernible facts. Okay. You know, but the, according to Gary Ween, Summers actually wanted him on television, this TV special he's putting together, which I think was on BBC. Okay. Uh, and, and Ween refused to go on. Okay. I don't know why, but he did, he did, he decided not to go on. All right. So at this point, I'm thinking Gary Ween is such a right wing nut that I think is a little bit over the top. Okay. And B, was there anyone Summers would not believe? Okay. Yeah, really. As, you know, Gene Carmen, yeah. Robert Slatzer, Gary Ween. Okay. I mean, and of course, Fred Otash. Right. Now, Fred Otash, as you probably know from reading the article. Right. Fr fr first of all, Fred Otash was a private investigator who was rather infamous for using unethical <laughs> kind of approaches yep. uh, to his cases. He was part of a horse drugging scandal. Okay, and had his license suspended for a rather length, long length of time as a private investigator. All right. Mike Wallace interviewed him and said he was the most amoral person he ever met. All right. Uh, back in those days, there was a, a magazine called Confidential, which was really a kind of scandal sheet about Hollywood and, and the political scene. Uh, when JFK was running for president, According to some of the reading that I did, they wanted Otash to write an article about JFK and the and the wild parties that Peter Lawford and the rest of the Rat Pack was attending. Fred Otash calls in this high price call girl, okay, in Los Angeles. And Ask her, um, do you know anything about these parties that uh, that JFK and Peter Lawford or and she says, no, never <laughs> heard of them. Okay, and then he goes, well, do any of your other friends in that business have they? He goes, no, nobody's ever told me about any of that stuff. <laughs> okay. And so finally, I guess as a last ditch effort, she goes, if I give you this hidden microphone and if I can get you an introduction to JFK, can you record anything off color that he proposed? And she turned him down and she wow. turned him down. OK, I mean, now, so I concluded the first part of the essay by saying, look, when the call girl turns down the pimp, <laughs> she, has, she has more ethics than than the pimp does. I, what does that say about that witness? Exactly. Okay. Okay. But oh, but Otash is in Summer's book. Right. All right. Okay. So that's how I concluded. You know, part one by saying this is the road that brought us to Joyce Carol Oates's book, Blonde. Okay. Right. All right. Uh, because Joyce Carol Oates didn't have very much of a problem with using some of this stuff, okay, all right? Uh, and so in the second part, what I essentially did was um, try to go ahead and show some of the specific problems uh, with the actual novel and the two films made from it, all right? Um, so let, 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 if if we want to cut to the chase, right at the end of the book, at the end of the novel, she has a paid assassin, which she calls a sharpshooter. Okay, but she, the guy kills Marion with a hypodermic. Okay, mm -hmm. so. That moniker sharpshooter was clearly meant to recall right. the assassination of JFK. Okay. And as she's dying, she has this fantasy about meeting her father. 
okay and this of course and, and this of course is a big part of the whole and this part is a fact that she never really knew who her father was she suspected who he was okay but she could never really find out who her father was so in the book and in both the films there's two main constructs to both of them and that the one was Gladys her mother who was obviously um when Marilyn was a small girl okay she was obviously imbalanced mentally imbalanced okay and in both films uh they talk about this fire that Gladys set I, I, and I believe that was a creation by Oates because I don't remember reading about it in any of the books I read all right and so she sets this fire and she's then sent to an asylum all right and Marilyn is then moved in with these temporary parents okay and then she's taken to an orphanage and then she lives in a series of foster homes all right see M Monroe did not you know she did not have a very good childhood no to put it mildly right. okay and this was one of her problems okay and she never really knew who her father was she never really knew who her stepsister was until she was 15. okay all right and so she had three psychiatrists from 1955 to 1962 all right but even though she had three psychiatrists she tried to take her life four or five times you know prior to 1962 okay and a lot of this greenson who, who final psychiatrist was and by the way greenson was seeing her all the time okay and i'm not exaggerating towards the end uh he was seeing her almost every other day maybe almost every day okay and he was actually trying to give her a family namely his okay and this ended up being a very very controversial aspect you know of his treatment of Marilyn but he came to the conclusion that you know nobody really could have helped a woman all right uh and she should have never been given almost a free license to these pills which we'll, we'll get to a little later and we will be right back DK's Corner, located on 802 East Lackawanna Avenue in Oliphant, Pennsylvania. Visit DK's Corner for hot and cold sandwiches, soups, salads, pizza, and delicious breakfast, including breakfast sandwiches, specialty coffees, and DK's Razzle Dazzle Flavor Shaken Espressos. And take it from me, the best cheese steaks around. Follow DK's Corner on Facebook and Instagram, or call them at 570 209 0278 to find out about their daily specials and catering. Check out DK's Corner, Oliphant's Little Hoagie Shop. And we thank DK's Corner for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. That's DK's Corner in Oliphant, Pennsylvania. Both films make a big deal about her unhappy childhood, uh, her mother, and going to the orphanage. All right. Um, Marilyn was then married to Jimmy Dougherty, one of her foster homes. And this is in the first film, but it's cut out of Brad Pitt's film. Okay. Um, in the original CBS one, they show the marriage to Jimmy Dougherty. Okay. When I think Marilyn was 17 or something like that at that, at that time. All right. And I think that lasted about four or five years. Marilyn went to work 
during World War II in an arms, I think a plane manufacturing plant in Southern California. And it was there that a photographer first started taking pictures of her, okay? And then she became a popular photography pinup kind of a model. Then she went to the Blue Book, Ev Evelyn Snively's Blue Book Modeling School, and she became a professional model. I think it's important to, to, to at least quote Evelyn Snively, which I did at the end of the article. She said she never had a client who started with less than Marilyn Monroe. And she never had a client that worked so hard to be good at what she did, you know, who really wanted to be somebody, hmm. you know, and draw herself up more or less by her own bootstrings in Marilyn Monroe. All right. And, and she did, she became a very popular uh, blue book model. All right. Then she was introduced to some people in, like Johnny Hyde in Hollywood. Okay. And this is how she began to get some bit parts in movies. All right. Johnny Hyde was a pretty big agent at that time. And he really liked Marilyn. I think he wanted to actually marry her. Okay. Uh, and he really helped her in his early career. All right. Um, and this is shown in both films. So then what happens is Johnny Hyde passes away. All right. And Marilyn in, I believe it's both films, gets an introduction to Daryl Zanuck. Okay. Big time Hollywood producer. He did The Longest Day. All right. On many, many other films. And it shows in both films him sodomizing her, okay, on the rug of, in his office. Now, there's only two people who could know about that. Okay, one of them is Zanuck, one of them is Monroe. I don't think Monroe ever said it. Zanuck actually said he didn't like Marilyn Monroe. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so whether that happened or not, or whether that's out of one of these... Uh, novels posing as nonfiction, I, I, I'm not sure. But Ose puts it in her book. And so then both movies have it in there, okay? All right, and this is supposed to help boost her career. All right, now, another very interesting thing is, and in, in it's, it's in both films, is her association with uh, both Peter Lawford and JFK. But before we get to that, because this is very important, in both films, because it's in the Oates book, Monroe has this triangle relationship with the son of Charlie Chaplin and right. the son of Edward G. Robinson both famous actors, okay? And according to both films, this goes on for a long, long, long time. And in fact, she's impregnated by Chaplin's son, okay? And I believe this began with, with Summer's book, all right? Uh, and this is sensationalized. In, in both pictures, all right? Uh, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of the sex angle, you know, in, in both pictures about this, especially in the Brad Pitt one, all right? That's how that got an NC-17. The first film, I think, in 10 years to get an NC-17 rating. Right. All right. Now, in both films, they follow through on this impregnation thing. Well, again, there's some very serious problems with this. Mm -hmm. But both films want to include it because they want to show this these horrific scenes about her getting an abortion. 
which she has nightmares about. All right. And in the Brad Pitt version, if you can believe it, in this uh, computer generated graphics, they have her embryo talking to Marilyn. Okay. Unbelievable. About- <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. You know, about abortion and the fact that this isn't the first well look number one leo cron who was maryland's gynecologist right said maryland never had an abortion yep okay so why should she have an abortion because she always wanted to have kids all right but she never had an abortion secondly in Robinson's book, all right, he never mentions any kind of romantic triangle that he had with Marilyn, okay? In the Chaplin book, all right, he says he dated Norma Jean Baker a few times, okay, at the very early part of her career, all right? But this wasn't at all any kind of sustained relationship, okay? In fact, he, he says she stopped seeing him once you get the big time. All right. So where is the basis for for, for all this stuff? You know, but Oates put it in her book, you know. All right. And and so, you know, so this is where I believe you can make a very. A very powerful case, you know, of character assassination, you know. Um, So then, of course. There's the whole thing with Peter Lawford, all right? And Joyce Carol Oates' uh, novel, Blonde, she actually calls him the president's pimp. Believable. Okay? She puts that label on him. Wow. Well, when we get to the bottom of this, all right, I don't think... I don't. I don't think that's at all justified. And I think uh, Don McGovern is working on this angle right now. This whole a whole rewrite of the P- whole Peter Lawford thing. Okay, right. I think we all know who Peter. Law- Peter sure. Lawford was a famous actor, right. born in England, comes to the United States, married one of John F. Kennedy's sisters. Mm-hmm. Okay, lived in Santa Monica, at a very nice beach house. All right. Um, he knew Marilyn because his wife was close friends with Marilyn. Okay. All right. Um, the only thing I could find is that Peter Lawford went out with Marilyn Monroe once when she was coming up the ladder. That was about it. Okay. Christopher Lawford, uh, Peter's son, remembers Marilyn because when they would have gatherings over at their house, he really liked, Marilyn was a very nice person who actually taught him how to dance. Okay. You know, and the idea that such and such a thing could be true is I think strongly vitiated by what really happened on the day that Marilyn passed away. Okay. Which is, to be frank, has been either discounted or ignored, you know, by all of these people in mm-hmm. all of their books and novels. All right. See, what, what really happened that day, and I had to get this from Gary Vitaco Robles's book, is that Lawford's wife was out of town. She was at Cape Cod, okay, and that weekend. He had a small gathering at his house, him and three other guests. Uh, all of them were in TV or the movie industry. Okay. I think Joseph Thurjom was one, a talent manager. Joe Narr and his wife, Dolores, was the, was the couple, and they were TV producers. All right. And so what happens is that Peter Lawford, called up Marilyn's house and invited her over for the dinner party. 
all right? She declined, saying that she was tired, but Peter Lawford was very disturbed by the tone of her voice. She seemed kind of despondent. Her speech was slurred, all right? Uh, and he knew that she was a pill addict, okay? And so he wants to go over, all right, to pick her up, all right, to get her out of the house. He's advised not to by uh, his manager at that time, a guy named Milton Evans, all right? But he has Evans call a guy named Rudin, who I believe was Marilyn's attorney, all right? And he calls Eunice Murray. Eunice Murray didn't know about Lawford's call to her, to Marilyn Monroe, but she said everything was okay, all right? And so Evans calls back Lawford and says, everything's fine. And Lawford says, maybe I should call Eunice Murray because she's just going to tell you the same thing I just told you. All right. So then even when the dinner party was over, he still wanted to go over there. But Evans advised him not to. Now, Evans had a secret agenda, which he didn't tell Lawford about. Right. Evans knew about Marilyn Monroe's being a sleeping pill addict. Okay, mm -hmm. how she would get on the phone at night and start calling people until she fell asleep. Right. All right. And he thought that it would look very bad if his client, the president's brother in law, was at Maryland's home when the paramedics came in to wheel her out on a stretcher. Okay. All right. Which it would have been pretty bad. Okay. And so, uh, and so he, this is why he discouraged him from doing this stuff right right well when evans talked to tony summers he explained this whole story to him about what happened that night all right uh and by the way mort saw was at evans house that night something i didn't know but mort saw was there okay uh and so summers asked him words of the effect there was no mention of robert kennedy and he said no of course not and he said very clearly anybody who thinks that somehow the kennedys were involved in maryland's death is nuts <laughs> okay and gary vitaco robles very pointedly said that that transcript was not in the netflix uh 2022 special that of course uh, not. Yeah, that, that that Summers produced. Okay. Right. All right. So these are the true circumstances of Lawford, what he was doing that day. All right. It's not what Joyce Carol Oates says it was. Right. All right. And it's, and I don't think it's, and Summers has a whole different version in this book also, you know, which, which I don't think holds up very well as I don't think Goddess holds up very well at all. Oh, no. by the way, let, let me say something about this. Since you guys are very interested in the John F. Kennedy case, when re rereading Goddess, I, I was really kind of stunned. Paul Hoke is named as one of the researchers in Goddess. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I thought that was interesting is that, you know, Paul Hoke is one of these guys who crucifies himself on a cross over purity in the JFK case, okay? Only he can be the judge of what's good and what's not in this field, right? Right. And here he is involved in what April Vivea said is an atrocious book, mm -hmm. Goddess. But then I found out that he actually reviewed the book. Wow. Okay. In his journal, Echoes of Conspiracy. I've been trying to find that review, okay? Uh, I haven't been able to find it yet. But, you know, I, I think there's a serious problem there with being a researcher on a book and then reviewing the book, okay? Yeah. 
And I, I believe he actually took the book seriously, you know, which which I don't. OK, for reasons that I've already stated, you know. Uh, so Gary Vitanko Robles in his book. Interviewed Cyril Wecht. Mm -hmm. who reviewed N N N the Noguchi autopsy. OK, and. Wecht agreed with Noguchi and Boyd Stevens. He could find no evidence <coughs> of any kind of murder theory in Monroe's death. And see what these people have done, okay, is uh, with all these claims of some kind of plot, of some kind of uh, nefarious, malignant goings on between the mob, okay, uh, some even say the FBI and the CIA, mm -hmm. you know, and the Kennedy brothers, you know, you know, why the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover yeah. would cover up something <laughs> like that is just beyond me. And anybody knows who's honest it. and intelligent right. that they didn't like each other. No. Okay. So if Hoover could have had something like that on JFK, but, I mean, come sure. on. You know, yeah. Uh, you know, and I don't have to talk about the CIA how much they hated Kennedy. Yeah. I mean, it's just utterly ridiculous. Or the mob, right? Or the mob. I mean, come on. You know. Uh, so the other thing is about the so-called wiring or surveillance on Marilyn's house, which in the Brad Pitt version they actually do something with that. You know, uh, there's never been any evidence of such. In fact, the guy who was supposed to have wired Marilyn's house for Hoffa, okay, Bernie Spindell, uh, his home was raided and they did, and they took his the tapes that were there and all the tapes that were there, they couldn't find anything, you know, any wiring of Monroe's home. All right. And in fact, in Gary Vitaco Robles' book, the, the Carroll uh, investigation found out that there was nothing at all odd about the wiring in that house. They found um, evidence of this, okay, uh, in a, in the, the, the actual wires were rewired, okay, and there was no prior evidence that uh that there was any kind of plant you know uh of of any kind of tap in the previous wiring you know so you know this is a big thing with mark shaw you know he actually says in his book what is it what is that piece of oh collateral damage collateral okay. damage yeah. yeah okay he actually says that he found out that the house really was wired by the you know baloney OK, you know, um, but that's not true either, you know. And so what this case is and what all of this crazy subterfuge of facts, you know, what this has produced is a kind of, you know, shroud over what really happened to Marilyn Monroe. And and Don McGovern and Gary have done a good job. See, what, 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 what the Monroe case really is, is a preview of what would happen, you know, in the Elvis Presley case and in the Michael Jackson case. Right. It's a matter of celebrity doctors not serving their clients very well, mm. you know, and that's a kind of understatement. Yeah, you know, uh, in in Vitaco Robles' book, he chronicles all the prescriptions that Engelberg and Greenson. Engelberg was a regular doctor; Greenson was her psychiatrist. They, in the last two months of her life, there were eight hundred pills. 
okay, wow. which comes to something like 13 a day. Wow. And when, when Weck saw this, he was astonished. You know, he said, those numbers are just out of the ballpark. You know, and any claim that Engelbert made of weaning her off these pills is simply not true. All right. And he never should have. Re and by the way, in Gary's book, he proves that Engelberg lied about all these prescriptions that he was giving Monroe. And that, you know, when, whenever a physician does something like that, that's very revealing that he understands that he committed malpractice. Okay. Sure. You know, and the official estimate is 47 nebutals and 17 chloral hydrates, which would have been enough to kill two people, wow. you know, let alone one. Hmm. All right. And I don't think you can get nebutal today. All right. Uh, so anyway, Wacht was very forceful on this. He did an interview with Gary Vitaco Robles. You know, he said, Engelberg should have been indicted, okay? You know, and the charge should have been manslaughter, maybe even third degree murder, all right? Okay, and in the modern world, that is what would have happened. But that, back then, before the Kennedy assassination, you know, there was not this kind of, uh, you know, obsession, you know, by the media with celebrities and stuff like that, okay? Right. And so that's why it didn't happen back then, you know? And that is what really happened to Marilyn Monroe, okay? That's what really happened to her. It wasn't Sam Giancana, no. you know, and, or anything like that, you know? Mm -hmm. It was that she was a victim of her own physicians, you know. Now, whether or not anybody could have cured her or anybody could have helped her, you know, that's an open question. And whether or not it was deliberate or whether or not it was accidental, you know, because see, what happens is you build up an immunity to these pills over time. And she right. just might have kept on taking because she couldn't get to sleep. But what, what Slasher did with this See, Eunice Murray, in her first story to the police, said that what made her curious about what was happening in Marilyn's bedroom was the light underneath the door, okay? She went and she knocked on the door at about 12.30, and she, and she said nobody answered, okay? So... She went back and rested, and she woke up at about 3.30, and the light was still on. This is what really worried her, okay, because Marilyn was very sensitive to light, okay, especially when she was sleeping, all right, and so she, f and see, and this is where the a problem comes. See, as Gary specified in his book, she did not call Greenson after 12.30. And this is where people get this idea there was a three-hour window. Okay. There wasn't a three-hour window. It was like a 45-minute window. All right. And so it was the second time that she called Greenson. Greenson actually had recommended her to Marilyn. Okay. Uh, as, a, as a house guest, a housemaid. And so... Greenson said, see if you can peer through the window, okay, all right, and so she did from the outside, and she said, it looks like she's sprawled across her bed, okay, she's naked, and so that's when Greenson decided to come over, they couldn't get in because the door was locked, and so then Greenson goes outside and smashes a brick uh, and then opens the, the window through the hole he made, okay? And that's how they got in, all right? And he immediately went over to the body, took her pulse, 
And he said, words of the effect, we lost her. Then he calls Engelberg. And I believe from doing this reading that the reason that there was like a 40 minute delay in calling the police is that Greenson was discovering all the pills in the room that Engelberg had signed off on. And these guys were really worried about what was going to happen, okay, if there was any investigation, okay? Because according to Greenson, he was not aware of all these pills that Engelberg was recommending. And like I said earlier, Engelberg lied about this, okay? Thirdly, there was another source that Monroe was getting pills from, a guy from the studio named Lee Siegel. All right. And so this really should have been the first of these celebrity doctor affairs. And it wasn't. And it wasn't. Instead, it became a kind of circus, you know, uh, through people like Schlatzer and Capel and Mailer, et cetera. All right. Um, now, the, the, you know, the problem I have with this, and by the way, I, I'm invited to... Uh, a Maryland fan club. I think it's going to be next month to make a speech about this. You know, as Sarah Churchwell wrote in a magazine article she did when the Brad Pitt movie came out. Okay. See, the problem with this approach to Marilyn Monroe, this sensationalistic, cheap, caricaturing, you know, and she included Joyce Carol Oates as part of this, you know, is that it really does a smear job on who Marilyn Monroe actually was and tried to be. Right. You know? uh, Marilyn Monroe attended literature classes at UCLA. Right. On her own. Okay. And she stood up for equal rights and women's rights in Hollywood. She despised Richard Nixon and the whole, you know, uh, committee in the House, the House on American Affairs Committee. Right. She didn't like Norman Mailer, refused to meet him because she said words to the effect, that guy worships at the altar of power. You can't fool me about him. Okay. You know, and this is why she liked the Kennedys, because she liked their progressive agenda. Right. Yeah. All right. And to and to be and let's make a clean breast of this. As Don McGovern says, there's never been any evidence that there was any kind of romantic or sexual affair between Bobby Kennedy and Marilyn. No. Now mm -hmm. in the JFK case. There might be one. Right. But Gary Vitaco Robles, I have to be frank about this. He even contests that one. Yeah. Okay. And that was supposed to have taken place at Bing Crosby's right. in 1962, I think. I, yeah. Okay. So in other words, with, what is it now? 60, in 62 years, <laughs> since the day Marilyn Monroe passed on, there's maybe one instance, okay, you know, to this whole, you know, melange of conspiracy theories. There's only one, okay? Uh, now, as I said earlier, Maryland was not on the West Coast during the Democratic Convention. Right. That didn't happen. All right. Now, the night of the JFK fundraiser, which is what all these people use, yeah. Because when Marilyn Monroe comes in and sings happy birthday, mm -hmm. okay, to, to JFK in that kind of playboy, you know, sexy manner that she did, all right, that night, and everybody uses that picture mm -hmm. at Arthur Krim's apartment after where they had a little gathering in New York right. City. Right, we talked about that with Don. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, well, that picture is cropped. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. Well, he probably explained it to you. Yeah, right? he did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. And, okay. and you know, Jim, it's so funny. We talk about all the conspiracies surrounding her. I think we made this joke with Don also. If half of these things were true, when Eunice Murray went to check on her, she would have literally had to wade through a crowd of people. <laughs> there to poison. Like, well, they all contradict each garbage. other, though, too. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. There, there was Giancana that had his right. goon squad Bobby, there. Bobby there was a CIA Bobby. assassin. Okay, you know, there was a right. doctor. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, there was somebody giving her a hypodermic, okay, <laughs> et cetera. All right. You know, so and, and by the way, the whole hypodermic thing, I hope you went over that with Don. Yeah, we talked. I mean, that that yeah. is such baloney, you know, uh, and that comes from the whole the so-called. And this is this really takes the cake, you know, the diary. Yeah, the diary. Yeah, we talked okay. about that. Now, remember this. Nobody ever heard of this. Monroe passed on in the summer of 1962. Nobody ever heard of this secret diary until Slatcher's book in 1974. Right. Okay. So in other words, it's not in any of the pamphlets or books that have been published up until that time. And the Giles book, which I think is 1969, that was a pretty substantial book. Okay. You know, but somehow it didn't come along until 1974. All right. And so it was him that really uh, started the whole thing about the secret diary. Now, now, in this diary, this is where the so-called Bobby Kennedy and the Bay of Pigs thing. Right. <laughs> right. Now, I think you guys understand this. Whatever Bobby Kennedy had to do with the Bay of Pigs, Okay, it didn't happen until after Bobby Kennedy, and I've done a lot of work on this, okay, had utterly nothing to do with the conduct of the actual Bay of Pigs operation. Right. That should have been enough right then and there yeah. to throw Slatcher up against the wall and just call him a fraud right then and there. All right. So then he says that Marilyn told him that he's the only person she ever sold this diary to. Well, that was okay until Gene Carmen came along. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So then Gene Carmen comes along and says, Oh no, I saw the diary it was laying right on her dining room table. Okay. Right. Okay. okay. All right. Well then the capper to this, of course, the capper to this is that, Marilyn Monroe didn't keep a diary. What she kept was a journal. Right. Which right. was found by, I think her, the woman's name is Imez Nelson, mm -hmm. who was the uh, curator of yeah. her belongings after she passed away. She was, uh, she's left a large part of her estate uh, to the Strasberg family, the actor's studio in New York. Okay. And, she was rummaging through those things, I believe, sometime in the 90s and found this kind of notebook, okay, which was then published. And the title of it is Fragments. And guess what? None of this stuff is in there. Right. No, none, of this, none of this stuff that all these people say was in, what she kept this diary on is in any of this stuff. So you have people like Lionel Grandison, who, as I wrote in the essay, Lionel Grandison was a low-level, like, clerk, okay, in the coroner's office, who many, many years later, under the influence of Flatzer, said that, yeah, there was a diary, okay? I mean, come on, this is ridiculous, okay? Uh, and so, uh, by the way, Fragments was actually made into a movie, all right, with, um, I think, some of the, uh, Uma Thurman was in it. I think Susan Sarandon might have been in it. Hmm. Okay, and they were reciting some of these things, you know, from from the book, fr from that uh, so-called journal. Fragments. But nobody could ever produce this diary. No, that would be worth millions if it was. If oh, it was at, at the very least. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> or or the tapes of the conversations. Right. Remember, Spindell was supposed to have had the place right. wired. Okay? Right. Okay. You know, so in all these years, you know, these things would have been sensational on the market, 
Okay, you know, the National Enquirer would have probably paid six sure. figures. Okay, uh, and, and, and nobody's because well, they're not there. That's why. All right. So that's the way this whole tabloid kind of society that we live in today. See, Marilyn Monroe did not like Hollywood. No. And, and this is another thing that gets kind of brushed under the rug here. You know, she didn't like Hollywood. She didn't like the roles she was getting. You know, she actually wanted to be a real actress, you know, and this is why she formed her own production company. Right. All right. She, I think she was the first woman since Mary Pickford who actually f formed her own production company. And she wanted to go ahead and make her own kinds of films. That's why she moved back east. All right. She didn't like Hollywood. And so when she was married to Arthur Miller, I think they lived in Connecticut. She also had an apartment in New York. Right. Okay. You know, and this was to get away from Hollywood. The reason she went back to Hollywood to do, uh, I think, what's the name of that movie? Something's Got to Give. That was the yeah. movie she was working on yeah. when, when she passed. Right. Is that she had a contract that she had to fulfill. Okay. All right. And this is where she got into all these problems with the studio. I think it was Fox. Right. Over her attendance on the set. And that would explain right. some of the cause of Bobby Kennedy. Right. Because, see. And we will be right back. DK's Corner, located on 802 East Lackawanna Avenue in Oliphant, Pennsylvania. Visit DK's Corner for hot and cold sandwiches, soups, salads, pizza, and delicious breakfast, including breakfast sandwiches, specialty coffees, and DK's Razzle Dazzle Flavor Shaken Espressos. And take it from me, the best cheese steaks around. Follow DK's Corner on Facebook and Instagram, or call them at 570-209-209. 0278 to find out about their daily specials and catering. Check out DK's Corner, Oliphant's Little Hoagie Shop. And we thank DK's Corner for sponsoring That's Enough Out of You. That's DK's Corner in Oliphant, Pennsylvania. And we would like to thank our sponsor, Gracious Day Grains. Uh, Sean, you like to eat healthy, don't you? I always, buddy. I try to eat healthy as much as I can. Yeah, and there is nothing healthier than uh, what they call like farm to table, right? This so when you when you can get something right from the ground and and make it and then put it right on your table. Um, and Gracious Day Grains, they have a tremendous selection, it, and it's totally organic. Everything is, you know, they don't use any sort of herbicides or pesticides or anything like that. They have. Um, a bunch of different uh, different products on their website, Gracious Day Grain. So if you go to graciousdaymilling.com, uh, you, you'll find a, a bunch of great stuff there, Sean. Yeah, you will, Billy. And, and it's owned by Tom Maxey, who's a, who's a great guy from Virginia. Um, he's a truth seeker, just like uh, me and you, buddy. And uh, Tom's growing philosophy follows the wisdom of farmers of centuries past. And a quote from Tom is, if we practice the right rotations, we exclude the bugs and weeds without needing herbicides or pesticides. So, I mean, this is great, Billy. I mean, what he's doing is fantastic. There's cornbread mix. There's cornmeal, popcorn. He sells buckwheat pan. Sean, have you had buckwheat pancakes? Have no, buddy. Oh my, they're delicious. I love buckwheat pancakes. And they, and and gracious uh, gracious day grain sells buckwheat pancakes. Just go to their website and and you know you'll be able to find all of this stuff there. You can order it right off the website. You can find out all about how they how they farm and, and their whole philosophy. Tom's philosophy is great stuff. It really is, Billy. And one of the things he does is he grinds small batches at, at very low temperatures, which retains the flavor and the freshness. Of course, and and it. I mean, you can't get any fresher than that. I mean, it's right literally right from the ground. So again, go to graciousdaymilling.com and just, you know, take a look on there. You can order whatever you want and, and they'll they'll send it right to your door. Can, I mean, again, it just, it doesn't get any, doesn't get any fresher than that, right? From Tom's farm to your door, to your table, so. Absolutely, and eat healthy, eat healthy and you'll feel better. Absolutely, I wish I could do that. I wish I could eat healthier, Sean. I, 
Well, start with Tom stuff, buddy. I, I'm going to. I'm going to order some of those buckwheat pancakes. I love. There making, you go. I'm going to try them too, Billy. Yeah, they're really good. All right, Gracious Day. We thank Gracious Day Grains for their sponsorship. Thank you. Another kind of baloney that Flatcher spewed was somehow that Parker, the chief of police, suppressed these phone calls, you know, and they were uh, held in abeyance at the request of Bobby Kennedy because right. Bobby Kennedy said words the effect he was going to name him the FBI. Oh, my God. <laughs> they're, they're in see, Gary Vitaco Robles' book. Okay. They're, they're in there. That the, that the LAPD had them in 1962, right. okay? And the Ronald Carroll Review in 1982 also had access to these phone calls, you know? And they were all through the main switchboard, okay, at the DOJ. And I think she talked to Angie Novello, who was uh, Bobby Kennedy's secretary, all right? And as Gary puts forth in that, in his book, you know, there's a documents and oral testimony from Monroe's publicist that uh, she was trying to get Bobby to help her because I think Bobby knew somebody on the board of directors at right. Fox, okay? And she was trying to get Bobby to help her on that. Okay, uh, l let's make a word about Donald Spoto. I don't know if Don McGovern ever talked about Spoto. Yeah. Oh, he, he did, did? A, little bit. a little bit. Okay. See, in his biography of Monroe, which I believe is 1993, he devoted a whole afterward to this whole thing. Okay. And he was really the first guy that I can recall who essentially called Schlatzer a fraud. Okay. You know. And he was the first guy to actually call out this whole circus that had evolved around, like I said earlier, let's trash Maryland for a buck. Right. This, you know, this industry. All right. Uh, he went a little too far with Tony Summers and, and Summers ended up suing him. Okay. I think that was successful. Okay, because he went a little too far by saying that uh, he might not have had the notes for something that he talked about in his book. But Slatcher also sued him unsuccessfully. But what Spoto did was he set a whole new paradigm in that field. And by the way, his book is pretty good. It's still worth reading today. I think it's one of the better ones. Right. about 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 uh, a biography of her life all right and then i believe what happened from that that's where you got people and today it's a pretty healthy community you know with april hmm. vivea janet bosky gary vitaco robles and don mcgovern mm -hmm. i you know I, I i discovered don mcgovern's book by accident yeah. i was just browsing amazon one night okay and I saw this book, Murder Orthodoxies. I had no idea what the heck it was about. Okay, so then I looked up the description. I go, oh, wow, a, a systematic study of all this crap. Okay, right. that, sounds, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. So I emailed Don through his publisher. It was a self-publishing company called Lulu. And I said, please send me your book. It sounds very, very interesting, you know. And so he sent me the book and then I had him on Black Op Radio with Lano Sanic. Okay. And he since he's gone on, I think he's been on with you twice. Yeah, you know, more he, than that, Jim. Yeah. We had him on about four times and he's coming yeah. back in the summer. Oh, oh, he's, oh really? <laughs> yeah, he's working on uh, David Heyman episode. We're gonna do. We're gonna Oh my God, yeah. David Heyman, please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But Jim, let me let me ask you a question, Jim, because we know that all this stuff is sensationalized. A lot of these people are looking to make a name for themselves, like Jeannie Carmen and and Slatzer and all these people. But here you have Brad Pitt, a, a powerhouse in Hollywood, and he gets involved in this project. With the the reaction was terrible too. I mean, some of the things they said they said they called it a hate letter to Marilyn Monroe and all this stuff. 
Uh, and we know we have uh, uh, he had a connection with the, the film director, uh, Dominic, Andrew Dominic. Dominic right. Is that the only reason that Brad Pitt would get involved? Like, what would possess a guy like Brad Pitt, do you think, to get involved in a project like this? Did he even read the script? Did he did he? OK, I, I you know, I didn't describe this scene that's just in the film and is taken from the book. I couldn't believe it when I was watching it. All right. I'm sure. Did you see the film? No, I didn't. I I can't bear oh, to watch it. No. I didn't. You, oh, you guys didn't. Good. I didn't see it. I saw part of the 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 first one was with Poppy Montgomery, right? Right. It was, yeah, I saw part of that one, but I, I okay. couldn't take the whole well, thing. Well, th- th- you're you're a better person for not seeing the second <laughs> one. Okay. I, I can, there's this scene. There's this scene where Marilyn gets on a plane. Okay. And she's flown to New York. Okay. I think it's the Carlisle Hotel. All right. She walks through. It was a huge, it must have been, you know, like a penthouse suite at the hotel. She walks through about 12 people, men and women. I don't recall if Jackie was there. God, I hope not. All right. And... She walks into Kennedy's bedroom. Kennedy's on the phone with J. Edgar Hoover. And J. Edgar Hoover is telling him about these rumors of these affairs he's having. Okay? I think there's two or three of them. He's lying in the bed, I guess resting his back with the phone. Okay? And she comes over. And there's no other way to say this. She, <laughs> he, he points down between his legs, oh, and and he and she gives him a fellatio. Unbelievable. Okay. All right. It's it's the clearest suggestion of that that I've seen, and I'm. This must be the other reason for the NC-17. Right. Okay. All right. And then wow. she leaves, and she says words to the effect. Well, it wasn't just sexual. Well, what the heck was it then? Okay, you know, and and this is what I mean. This is what's so demeaning about this, you know. And I, I I'd like to think that Brad Pitt didn't read the script, right? Okay, because he has done good films like The Big Short. Okay, right. that was a pretty sure. good movie. Okay, but you know, I I think he did it out of loyalty to this rather talentless Andrew Dominic. Okay. Okay. You know, I, I that's what I'd like to believe. All right. Makes sense. Okay. I, I sure as heck hope that's the reason. And I sure as heck hope he learned his lesson. You know. Um but that's the best spin that I can put on that. Wow. Crazy. So so this is this is a you know <coughs> in the uh, essay, you know, I tried to say that this is a real problem we have, you know, with this, the fall in the tabloidism that a lot of these publishing companies, you know, have, and a lot of the media, Mm -hmm. because see, if you recall, like I said, in the essay, Gene Carmen was on 31 talk shows. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. 31. Now, if she was on 31, you know, Slasher had to be on almost as many. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can see some of these things on YouTube. Right. Unfortunately. There's one from Australia. uh, There's one from England. You know, I mean, if you and and you've never seen a worse collection of clownish witnesses than you've seen on some of these talk shows. And Double Cross, of course that terrible uh, that novel by the Giancana's Sam and Chuck Giancana which the media fell for hook line and sinker yep in that one Giancana says that he owned an interest in Maryland's contract <laughs> okay now if you go ahead and read about Maryland's movie career. Um, 
it's clear that Johnny Hyde is the guy who had her contract. Right. And then signed her up with Fox. Okay. You know, and then she went to another studio and then she went back to Fox after. So the idea that Giancana, this guy in Chicago, had this kind, well, if, let's put it this way. If Giancana had any interest in her contract, where was he on the day that she announced Marilyn Monroe Productions? Yeah. Okay. That that got a lot right. of publicity. Okay. You know. Uh, but anyway, that's the way that this went. You know that that's the way that crappy novel Double Cross worked. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I if I don't remember this distinctly, but I think it actually said that he had something to do or knowledge of her assassination. You know. Oh, no, Giancana. Yeah. Yeah. It claimed that he sent a couple of guys needles and somebody else and they, they, they assassinated. <laughs> yeah. They, we just went over this, Jim. We just have we an episode, an episode on this. Yeah. Uh, debunking it. Yeah. He said, so the claims in that book is so outrageous. It was hard to get through the whole thing, to be honest with you. Just saying, oh, we sounded oh, 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 stupid saying this stuff. Who did you have on? Nobody. We did it. I did a review. Oh, you did it yourselves? Bill. Yeah. Me and Bill yeah, did okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, well, and every, just, every major tenant of that book, has been discredited. Right. Okay. Right. You know, and, and I, I did a lot of work on that book, you know, uh, about the West Virginia primary. Right. And we and talked the about that. Thing. We mentioned yeah. that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And the book is just full of crap. Right. All right. Mark Shaw has, uh, you know, become uh, a guy who borrows, or, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe this. The first major speech I ever saw Mark Shaw give was at the Beverly Hills Library with Bob Tannenbaum. Now, I'm sure you know who Bob Tannenbaum sure. is, right? Okay. Right. And Bob, Bob, gave a, Bob gave a really good speech, mm-hmm. okay? He's a very smart guy, yeah. very experienced prosecutor, okay? Yeah. And, he, and he understands the law, okay? All right? Mark Shaw comes in and... I think his first full book on the JFK case was The Poison Patriarch. He actually believed Double Cross. He actually believed that Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger and that Joe Kennedy uh, went to the mob and asked his brothers and sisters in the mob to go ahead and rig the election so his son could be president. Yeah, I mean, when when I heard that, you know, I was ready to just, you know, I go, oh my god, you know, my eyebrows raised, my jaw dropped. I go, this guy is is so. I mean, come on, how could anybody trust that book? And then who's the other? What's his name? Patrick David. Oh, Ben. Ben. Um. Yeah, I know who you mean. The the the. He's got a radio show, a podcast, or whatever. It's called That's- Valuetainment. Yeah. Okay. Well, he had this other guy on, Fred Keze. Fred, my, Michael Francis. We, Jim, we had his statement. We we brought Don on, and I read Michael Francis' we statement. We went we through, through the whole Don. thing, and we yeah. yeah we destroyed Michael Francis' yeah. statement. Line on. by line, literally. Yeah, line by line. <laughs> when his father, because he claims that his father yeah. said this and and made this claim when when Bobby Kennedy wasn't even Attorney General at the time. <laughs> You know, but wait a minute! But I, I hope you got into the part. Doesn't he say that Marilyn Monroe was used in the CIA plots to kill Castro? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 he says that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. He says it. Yeah. Nope. How did you guys keep a straight face? It was what hard. We had to keep stopping. It was, it, was, it was ridiculous. It was bad. It was bad. But you're right. That guy gave Michael Francis, Jim. He gave him a following that he has now because yes, Michael Francis has a very big following. Right. And you know yeah. what? So does Mark Shaw. If you look at Mark Shaw on YouTube, some of the things he's on, you see like 2 million views on that. And that's disgusting. Yeah, well, that's that because that guy, I think his name is Hammond. Right. He has him up at that uh, in San Francisco. Okay. I wrote Hammond a letter, which I put on my Substack uh, uh, site. Okay. I, you know, and I explained to him, you know, I don't know what you think you're doing, but 
having Mark Shaw on for a JFK anniversary is not a very wise thing to do if you're really interested in scholarly <laughs> right. research. Right. And that's right. what you're supposed to be interested in. And yeah. I said, you know, look, Marilyn Monroe was not murdered. Okay, and you can talk to either Boyd Stevens or Cyril Wecht or Thomas Noguchi, and they know a heck of a lot more about pathology than Mark Shaw does. Okay, yeah. you know, you give this guy a platform, okay, where he gets literally a million views, right. and you know, and you're doing a real disservice to the public. And Jim, you know? that guy, that that Patrick guy, he also claim he also can, tries to compare Trump to JFK too, which is so oh, frustrating. My God. Yeah, he's they, constantly oh. doing that. Yeah, okay. Well, because he became a successful entrepreneur, uh, he admires you know people like Trump, who actually didn't become a second, mostly due to his father. Right. Okay. Of course. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Uh, so, yeah, so th this is the whole morass that we're stuck with, right. you know, in this whole Marilyn Monroe field, you know, in which I believe it cheapens and caricatures, you know, everybody who's been involved in it. You know, the, the Carol, um, see, Gary Vitaco Robles, he petitioned the L.A. District Attorney's Office and he got something like 640 pages of the Carroll investigation. Everybody refers to this 29 page summary report, but Gary got the backup to it. The in interviews, what the investigation, you know, was about, okay. And the evidence, et cetera. And it's right. all, well, not all of it, but a lot of it is in his book. Okay. And so the, the Carroll report, as uh, Gary said, this is, is probably the definitive investigation, you know, of of of, of that case, and uh, it was done by professional people. All right, they're the ones that brought in Boyd Stevens from San Francisco, okay, and he's right. the one who backed up uh, Noguchi, you know, on this. All right, and I really wish that they would have made all that stuff public. You know, uh, because that would have dispelled, you know, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this rigmarole that's grown up in the weeds, you know, since that time. Jim, uh, we um, we've kept you a long time and we really appreciate it. I do have one one topic uh, and and I'm I don't know if this is, you know, if this is something that we, we want to have you back for. Um, it totally, totally off topic though. Totally different uh, topic. This is going back to, to JFK. Um, I, I was talking with, uh, somebody, th this woman that I work with and telling her about our podcast and kind of what, what we do and what we talk about. And she said, Oh, she said, um, you might be interested in this. She said, my great grandfather was a man named Leander Davy. What? And, yeah. Are you serious? God. And I looked up the name and the first thing that popped up was Leander Davy is a witness that James Diogenio believes helped establish the Clay Shaw was Clay Bertrand. <laughs> the, court, the court of the two sisters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it was at that bar down yeah. there in New Orleans. Yeah. I can't believe that. She said she never met him. You know, it was her, her great grandfather. But she said that's you know that's sort of her her claim to fame. Uh, you know, her connection to the to the Kennedy assassination. But, wow! Uh, yeah, what a million to one shot that was. was that? Yeah, <laughs> pretty crazy, huh? Yeah, we see. We found out about this guy when Lion Garrison was Jim Garrison's son. Okay, and Lion Garrison it was became a successful attorney down there in new orleans and i called him up a couple of times and i visited with him okay down there in new orleans and he wrote me a letter saying me and my siblings have decided that you should copy my late father's uh memos that he had left like holy jesus christ so we went down there with about four or five people Okay, and we spent like a day at Kinko's, okay, copying all this stuff. And this is when I found out about Leander Davé. 
Yeah. And I go, oh, my God, Garrison had this kind of stuff in his files, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and you know, and, and, uh, and okay, you want the long and let's do it in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. Leander DeVay was at this Court of the Two Sisters uh, bar and Clay Shaw frequented this place and Oswald was there one night. Right. Okay. And I, if I remember this correctly, I hope I'm getting it right. I hope you correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, he asked for Bertrand. Right. And this guy who was Shaw's friend, I can't remember his name right now. Okay. But uh, he was one of the guys that Sheridan used to say this was really Bertrand, when in fact he wasn't really Bertrand, okay? He's the one who said, I'll get him for you. Gene okay. Davis? That's it, yeah, Davis, that's it, that's it, yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right, okay. And so what this told me, uh, amongst other things, was that Davis was pretty close to, to Shaw, okay? And I, you know, some people like Peter Via, who went through this stuff a very long time ago, he actually thought that Davis might have been, you know, Shaw's procurer or plain words pimp. Okay, you know, uh, and this when I when I read this, I go, holy Jesus, you know, and uh, and so he was interviewed by the HSCA. Okay, now the problem is that when he got to the HSCA, um, he expanded his story like a lot of these people do. Okay, and this is the problem I have with using him today. Okay, because the ARB declassified, of course, a lot of the HSCA stuff, you know. Uh, but that that's an incredible. That's an incredible coincidence. Okay. All right. Let, let me give a plug to some of my stuff and then let me give you a suggestion for a future show. Okay. 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 Kennedysandking.com is my website. Okay. And that has all the current reviews and discussions that me and other authors put up there. My latest book is a JFK assassination show colds. Which I think you've had some people on we've about had, that. We've right? had everybody, everybody on, yeah. Everybody. Yep. Okay. All right, which I think is a good book. All right. Uh, I have a Substack, and I hope you guys read the Substack. I did a four part review of American Conspiracy. Yeah, I just read the, that. The Octopus. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was not very impressed uh, with it. If you read it, you'll see why. Right. Okay. So maybe we can come back and we can talk about that. Okay. Uh, the director tries. And the writer Hansen uh, didn't turn down an invitation to debate me, okay, which I was eager to do, actually. All right. Uh, but it's just very interesting that Netflix turned down Oliver on JFK Revisited, but they accepted this. Right. You know, that, that was, I thought that was interesting. And I talked about that at the end. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, gentlemen. All right, Jim. Thank you. As Thank always, you very much. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Okay. My pleasure. Good All luck. Right. All right. Thank Thanks, Jim. Have a great Bye -bye. night. Take All care. Right. Bye-bye. That's Enough Out of You podcast is executive produced and written by Bill Rader and Sean Kane and edited by Bill Rader. The That's Enough Out of You podcast and logo are exclusive property of Bags of Chicken, LLC. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or accounts of this podcast without the express written consent of Bags of Chicken LLC is prohibited, so don't even try it.